Hey, come on, your hands are warmed up on every single campus. Put your hands together for King Jesus. Amazing. On every single campus, if you're not sitting yet, you guys can grab your seats. And um, I, I would just love to pray and invite the Holy Spirit uh, to clear his heavenly throat and to speak. Can anyone just agree with me as we just come before Jesus that we need his voice today? Amen? So let's just pray. Father God, we love you. Holy Spirit, we invite you. Make Jesus felt amongst us today. So say what you need to say. Encourage the way that only you can encourage and do it for your name's sake. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. If we haven't had a chance to meet yet, my name is Dan Leanne, one of the teaching team here. And uh, we wanna just say thank you so much for coming out and uh, hanging out with us on this Sunday on all of our campuses. Uh, we as a church want everyone everywhere in an everyday relationship with Jesus because we know that an everyday relationship with Jesus, come on, makes all the difference, you know what I'm saying? In a dark moment, things just seem more hope-filled. In a difficult situation, come on, you just get through with a smile on your face. Come on, life is different when you have an everyday relationship with Jesus and making a decision on a Sunday morning to get dressed and to you know, spend $42 on gas to get to church is a wonderful decision to make at the beginning of the week if you want an everyday relationship with Jesus. So thank you so much for coming out. Uh, we're coming to the end of a series we've called Marked by Victory. In Australian, it's marked by victory. In American, it's marked by victory. And we just believe that God intends each and every single one of his children to live life victoriously with a pep in their step, with, a, with, a, uh, with some air in their tires, with confidence in their soul. God wants us to live victoriously. And that's the reason we've studied through the book of Romans, chapter eight, over the last five weeks. This is week six, and I'm telling you all, it's been amazing. Come on, how many people have enjoyed this study through Romans chapter eight? It's been incredible. We started off by looking at how there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We're filled with the Spirit, all of us, irrespective of our backgrounds, irrespective of our brokenness, irrespective of our ordinariness. God chooses to fill us with His Spirit, and the Spirit convinces us that we are children of God. We get to call Him Abba Father, and we, as sons and daughters of the God Most High, get to enjoy life through that lens. As if that wasn't cool enough, we all get to recognize that God works all things for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose, that our suffering has a purpose. And last week we talked about how we all have a destiny. We were all predestined to be made into the image of Jesus. If you've ever, ever had a question about your purpose, about your destiny, you can turn to Romans chapter eight and it points out really clearly that it is your destiny every single day by his spirit to be more like Jesus. Come on, smile, that's good news. This has been such an encouraging, uplifting, empowering series, but I wanna ask you this question. Do you feel more marked by victory today than you did six weeks ago? In all seriousness, it's possible to sit in church and to hear good talks and to, to, to go through the holy motions, do a little bit of Jesus karaoke, fist bump some people on the way out, like basically check off perfect attendance, but to be hearers of the word, but not necessarily believers or doers of the word. Are you more marked by victory now, six weeks after this study in Romans chapter eight than you were when we began? Do you have more air in your tires? Do you have more pep in your step? Do you have a confidence that's been restored that may have been lost over the last couple of years? Are you more marked by victory today now than you were six weeks ago? Because I know for a fact from many conversations that I've had with people within our New Spring family that, that people in general have no issue with the theology or the theory of Romans chapter eight, but they struggle with feeling it, with truly believing it. And if you don't feel it nor believe it, you'll never live it. So there are, all, there are a bunch of people in our church after six weeks who have God telling them that they were meant to be marked by victory, by joy, by confidence, by a more than conqueror kind of spirit, 
but they walk around life every single day with their head hung low, with their eyes basically following the ground, wondering what bad thing is gonna happen next. Are you more marked by victory now than you were six weeks ago? And if you struggle, you're not alone. Because I know a lot of people find it hard to be marked by victory when so much of their past has been defined by defeat. You find yourself right now thinking about your life story up to this point and you're going, you know what, Dan? The stuff that I've done, the lines that I've crossed, the mistakes that I've made, there is no way I'm ever gonna get ahead of the scoreboard again. God must be angry at me. He must be wanting to judge me because I have sinned so many times in my life. The L's that I continually take because of this habitual sin, this thing that's hidden in the dark that no one else knows about but I know all about, it makes me feel like the biggest loser on earth. So you're out here with that cool shirt on telling me that I'm marked by victory but the reality is I feel like a loser right now because my past has been defined by defeat. Maybe you had a death word spoken over you at some point in your journey. Maybe a loved one told you that you weren't worthy of love, that you would never amount to much, that you'd always be a failure and that word has followed you around all of your life. You might find yourself in your 40s, 50s, 60s right now and that death word is still resonating deep in your head and you find it so hard to truly believe that you were destined to be marked by victory. So you walk around like one who is defeated. I get it. For a lot of people in the world today, for a lot of people even in our church, they find it hard to live life marked by victory because so much of their past has been defined by defeat. It's hard to feel marked by victory. It's hard to have confidence. It's hard to have that pep in your step. It's hard to feel air in your ties when it feels like every single day you take another L. It's hard to feel marked by victory when you feel like life's a struggle. You you never feel like you're getting ahead. You're always behind on the scoreboard. You know what I'm saying? Like when it comes to your work, it feels like your your boss has got it in for you and, 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 and you can never do anything right. You're always getting yelled at. There are some mothers in the room going, hey, what? that's nice, Dan, talking about victory, but I'm here with three kinds of baby food in my hair. I haven't washed my hair like in two weeks. It's, it's easy to talk about victory on a Sunday morning. Come to my house on Monday night. It's a whole different story. There are some people who say, you know what? Financially, I never feel like I'm getting ahead. It feels like as soon as I do save up a little bit of money, I gotta go fill my gas tank up with gas and all my savings are gone again. It's so hard to get ahead in life. Every day seems like a struggle. It feels hard to be marked by victory when everything that I do feels like a push up a very steep hill and my days are defined by defeat. And what's really, really sad is that this experience grooves its way into our head. And I meet people all the time who feel like they're not only defined by defeat, but now because of their experience up to this point, they're destined for defeat. So you hear people say these things, it it creeps into their language. Because of that, nothing ever good's gonna happen for my life. I can never expect a, a peaceful family or an amazing marriage. I've done too much, I've seen too much. I've been to many dark places. Every day is gonna just be dark. It breaks my heart when I hear people talk about a good season that they're enjoying in life, but they're just waiting for the bad season that's just around the corner because things can only be so good, come on for so long. If I've been defined by defeat in my past, I've gotta be destined for defeat in my future. We have a phrase for that in the South, and I'm a Southerner now, like officially, seriously. I know how to park a truck. I eat way too much Cracker Barrel on a Sunday. I care way too much about college football. We got a phrase for that, it's called stinking thinking. Or as like we all say it, stinking thinking. And that grooved thinking causes children of God who are marked for victory to live out their days defined by defeat. But what I wanna do in these few minutes with us this morning in our 9.15 gathering, our most pumped up gathering for the week. Can the Anderson campus say amen? Come on. Is I wanna crack open, the, it's another southernism. We're gonna crack open the window. We're gonna crack open the window on this stinking thinking and we're gonna allow, come on, the spirit of God and the word of God, come on, and the truth of God to push out these thought patterns that are not fitting, come on, for a child of God. That's what's happening here in the book of Romans chapter 
8, verse 31. And as we read through it, my heart's hope, my heart's prayer is that God would take the words from this page and he would sketch them on the walls of your mind. And as they sit on the walls of your mind, may they filter down to your heart. And as they get into your heart, it would cause you to live differently. Come on, come Monday morning. I'm believing for more victory in your households, more victory in your marriages, more victory in your parenting, more victory in your schooling, more victory in your businesses, more victory as you look in the mirror every single morning, you were destined to be marked by victory, and if you allow the word of God to soak in, you will be. Can someone say a good amen to that? Romans chapter 8, verse 31. The Apostle Paul is bringing this glorious chapter to a close. It's like a pop quiz, basically. It's like we've talked about a bunch of things, but now I want to take these bunch of things that you kind of know in your head, but I want to get them deep into your heart so that we can get them out into your life. Romans chapter 8, verse 31, the Bible says, what then shall we say in response to these things? Or in other words, we've talked a lot about victory. No condemnation, filled with the Spirit, child of God, all things working for good, predestined to be made like Jesus. We've heard about all these things. What should we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for all, how will he not also along with him, graciously give us all things. Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors. Say more. Can I say more like an Australian? More. Can I say more in American? More. More than conquerors, marked by victory. For I'm convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. There are four things that I want you to get out of these nine verses. And here are the four things that we need to learn how to confess every single day. In fact, if you're taking down notes, you can pull out your leather-bound journals right now. If you have an iPhone, an iPad, if you have a Google device or a Samsung device, find a note app. And this is the title for today, Confessions of a Conqueror. These are things that if we would confess every single day, if we would speak them out in faith every single day, if we would lean into the word of God, if we would trust the powerful word of God more than our feelings and speak this out into whatever situation we're facing, I'm promising you, you're going to deal with whatever life dishes up so much more victoriously. The confessions of a conqueror. Here are the four statements. God is for me. I am chosen. I am free. God's love has got me. Come on. God is for me. I am chosen. I am free. God's love has got me. If you want to print some t-shirts this week with those four statements on them, it'll be a good decision. If you have a little bit of spare space on your thigh and you are like kind of predisposed to that tattoo kind of life and you want to kind of fill that space up with some truth that's going to help you, tattoo, God is for me. I am chosen, I am free. Come on, God's love has got me. If you got four kids and you aren't happy with the names that you gave them and you wanna change them by depot this week, I'll drive you down to the courthouse and we can rename them. God is for me, I am chosen, I am free. God's love has got me. Get that deep into your spirit. We gotta speak it out out loud every single day. That's the reason the Bible says here in verse 31, what then shall we say in response to these things? 
If you feel defined by defeat, you got to say something out loud that is different than the narrative that is flowing around your head. you got to speak it out in faith because there is power in your words. That's the reason the Bible says in the book of Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 21, in your tongue there is the power of life and death. There is a biblical like, principle called the law of first mention. I won't go deeply into it. It basically just means the first time you see something mentioned, pay special attention because it helps us understand that theme or that topic going forward. You gotta understand the law of first mention when it comes to words. Words were first introduced in the Bible not for the sake of communication, but for the sake of creation. You see, in the beginning, the Bible says in the book of Genesis chapter one, God said, let there be light and there was light. Can you see what's happening? Words weren't just given to us so that we could understand each other. Words were given to us so that we can build things, so that we could create things. That's the reason there are some people here who are carrying around death words spoken over them years ago by someone you don't even care that much about. Why? Because words have got power. They've got the power to bludgeon you to death or to build you up. Paul is telling us, use your words every single day in every single environment you find yourself in, in your house, in your homes, in that car, on the way to school, when you get to work, you're sitting in class, whatever you're doing, speak these things out in faith and it'll change everything about the way you live your life. God is for me. I am chosen. I am free. God's love has got me. Let's break this down. God is for me. Everyone say, God is for me. God turns to your neighbor and say, hey, God's for me. Turn to your other neighbor and say, hey, second choice, God's for you. Come on, God is for me. The Bible says here in verse 31, if God is for us, who can be against us? It sounds like a rhetorical question, but you gotta take this rhetorical question and turn it into your reality. If God is really on your side, what can you face in any given day that you can't deal with? I need some crowd participation right now from men and women in this room who have got some opinions about NBA basketball. Can I hear, just imagine you're playing an intramural league, okay, you have to pick a five, you have to pick a five. You are in that five, who are the other four at their peak, living or dead, in the starting five in your dream team? Come on, give me some words, give me some. Okay, so Michael Jordan, first and foremost, okay, prime Michael Jordan. Not like red eyes, sipping on some whiskey, Michael, but like, like prime, <laughs> tongue hanging out, Duncan from the, that Michael, okay, so Michael Jordan's in there. Okay, so LeBron, okay, so the King family yells out LeBron James because they got the statistics. They, they, they're the statistic driven people, I'm with you, okay? So prime, we're talking about prime like LeBron, not, not, I'm talking like kind of Miami kind of, Miami, which, which one? Okay, so basically LeBron, who else gets in there? Who else gets, in, sorry? Shaq gets in there, Shaquille O'Neal, okay? Like 19, all 19 feet of him. Okay, one more, I need one more. Sorry, Steph Curry. We're gonna throw, we're gonna throw someone current in there. We're gonna throw Steph in there because he loves Jesus and can shoot, all right? So imagine this, you, LeBron, Michael Jordan, Shaq, Steph Curry, roll into your intramural league. Is there any five that you could face that you'd be afraid of? No, why? Because look at your dream team. As you enter into this week, recognize that you enter into this week with your dream team. You, God, Son, Holy Spirit. Come on, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There is nothing in front of you that is as strong as the God who is behind you. So how dare you, come on, not walk around with a little bit of swag. If you're gonna clap, you might as well clap properly in this room because if God is for you, who can be, but Dan, he's not for me. He's against me. He's angry at me. He's pushing In the other direction, he ain't helping me out, no. The Bible says here, if he gave you his son Jesus to die on a cross, his precious, perfect son, if he would do all of that, how dare you think that the God of this universe isn't the wind in your sails and pushing you at your back? Come on, if God is for me, who can be against me? No one. Point number two, write this one down. Not only is God for you, you're chosen. That should put a pep in your step. Come on, that should put a bounce in your days. You are chosen. Why is the Bible says here in verse 33, who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? Say, I am chosen. 
Come on, say it out loud like someone who was chosen. I am chosen. I was picked out of the massive sea of humanity. He found me and he picked me up. I don't know why, but I was chosen. Come on, smile, that's good news. I'm not bad at sport, but I'm not good at sport, okay? So in my entire life, I have never, when I was growing up, I've never been picked first, all right? Uh, I kind of like, uh, I, I was never, when you really, you know when you kind of pick teams, there's really only the first couple who get picked, you know what I'm saying? The first couple get picked, everyone else kind of gets allotted, you know what I'm saying? And then the last couple, they fight over who has to take them, you know what I'm saying? I was never down that end, but I was never one of the first picked, all right? So I'd always like sit around and go, Dan, and I kind of would know that, hey, you know what, you don't really want me, but I'm not terrible, so I'm kind of on the team, all right? Okay, so understand my delight. When early this year, I'm away for a friend's birthday, and there's a whole bunch of guys there, and we're going away on a golf trip, all right? There's a golf trip. Here's the, key, here's the, key, the catch. No one plays golf on this trip. No one's a golfer except for me. I'm a very ordinary golfer, but I'm a passionate, consistent golfer. So out of everyone on that trip, I was the best golfer. I heard them at lunch fighting <laughs> over who was going to get Dan Leanne. I could not wait to the draft. Because you know what? With the number one overall pick, Dan Leanne was selected, and I know no word of a lie. This is how I got up out of my chair and I did this. <laughs> That's how you should walk every single day. Knowing that he picked you, Greg. Knowing that he picked you, Danny. Knowing that he picked you, Amanda. No matter what your day holds, know the one who holds the world saw you before the beginning of time, cleared his throat and said your name, you are chosen. You weren't overlooked, you weren't forgotten, you're not disqualified, you're chosen. You're not a failure, you're not a fragmented fool, no. You are the one who in amongst everything going on in the world, God said, I want you. You are chosen. Amen? Not only is God for you, not only are you chosen, number three, write this one down. I am free. I am free. Say that out loud. I am free. free. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Hey, you got in trouble, but you were free. Hey, you racked up a debt that you couldn't pay, but Jesus paid it, now you're free. I am free. That's the reason the Bible says here in verse 34, who then is the one who condemns? No one. Or in other words, the enemy is gonna try to condemn you. There is a real being in the earth. He has an army. His name is Satan and the demons, and they will consistently, continually do what they were designed basically to do, to accuse the brethren, But here's the kicker, even their demonic negative work will be used by God for his glory to turn you towards God to see his goodness, but they're gonna accuse you and they're gonna say stuff stuff about you, they're gonna bring up some chapters about your past, they're gonna flash some scenes up about stuff that you're ashamed of, they're gonna try to condemn. We try to condemn ourselves. When we look into the mirror so often, we have so much negative talk, So so many negative thoughts. There is so much around in this earth trying to condemn, but here Paul is saying, who or what can condemn you? No one, nothing, nada, nil. Why? Because Christ who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Or in other words, bottom line, all of us have sinned, all of us have messed up, All of us have got stains on our soul. All of us have got mud on our hands. All of us have got a rap sheet longer than we would care to show anyone else. But our good friend Jesus got into the ear of the judge of this world, whispered and said, hey, they're okay because I died for them. What a beautiful picture. Family who was marked by victory that Jesus right now is at the right hand of God, interceding, talking to God about us. Come on, smile, that's really good news. On Thursday night, I'm up in my, this little study area in my house and I'm trying to just 
like wrestle this message down and I'm having a hard time. So many things I wanna say, so few minutes to say them. And I'm just struggling. In the middle of this struggle, I get a text from my friend Conrad Geiger from the Columbia campus and some of the prayer team from our Columbia campus. He just sends me a picture of him and his friends praying for me. I'm telling you now, my, my, my chest puffed out, you know what I'm saying? I felt energy fill me again as I knew I had a friend praying for me, contending for me. And I'm telling you now, the next hour of sermon writing was so much easier. Get this, Jesus is right now in God's ear praying for you. How dare you walk around defeated? How dare you think that that habitual sin will always get the better of you? How dare you think that you are destined for struggle and for pain and to always be, but how dare you think that way knowing that Jesus right now is in his Father's ear and he's saying sweet and good things about each and every single one of you. Come on, smile. That's really good news. God is for me. I am chosen. I am free. Fourthly and lastly, write this one down. God's love has got me. Can you say that out loud? God's love has got me. In dark days, God's love has got me. Come on, uncertainty on the earth. Come on, pain on the inside, God still. Things aren't as they should be in my household, but they will be one day, but in the meantime, I'm just hating this job right now, but I had to take it in 2020. I'm way overqualified, but I know that. Come on. I'm finishing college. I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm the parent of a kid who's finishing college, and they don't know what they're... I've got to pay for this college that my kid just finished college, and he doesn't know what to do. <laughs> I promise you it makes a difference. I've been married 26 years. Got married at 21, but I first saw Crystal when she was 13. Uh, uh, she was 14, I was 13. And she was the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. My entire game, I used to be a real quiet person, introverted up to that point. I became like Dan after that because I'm like trying to, I was never gonna be like the tall guy, I was never gonna be the blonde guy, so I was gonna be the loud, funny guy, you know what I'm saying? And then, so it took me a couple of years for her to even pay me some attention. So by the time I'm 15, 16, like kind of we're talking a little bit, and I just decided at that point, I was gonna give no one else an opportunity to cut in on this girl, you know what I'm saying? So I'm like kind of just, I'm everywhere she was, all right, I was too. If she would talk to me on the phone, I would talk all night, you know what I'm saying? Doing the whole kind of, you hang up, you hang up, you hang up. Okay, let's count to three. One, two, three. Ah, you didn't hang up, I was doing that, right? Not because I necessarily had much to say, but because I didn't want anyone else having a chance to talk to her. Because there were other suitors sniffing around. You know what I'm saying? What time do you finish school? 3.30, guess what, 3.30. Hey, what's up? What are you doing here? Well, it's my school, I'm finishing. Yeah, well, let's hang out. You're working in the weekend, what time are you finishing? 5.30. Hey, what are you doing? I'm, I'm just, I'm just, I was just like in the area, like kind of, you know, 50 miles from my house, but hey, let's <laughs> hang out. I wasn't gonna give anyone a chance to cut in on this game that I was playing, this angle that I was working with this beautiful girl. Because I was smitten and every single time she turned around, she was gonna have a slightly chunky Asian guy going, hey, let's hang out. No matter what you go through in life, stressed about your future, sitting in a doctor's waiting office. Struggle with some relationship stuff. Money stuff, real difficult. The Bible says here, I'm convinced that nothing can separate us from the love that is in Christ Jesus. Or in other words, whatever you go through, Wherever you turn, you're gonna find the love of God in Christ Jesus going, hey, I'm here. Can someone say a good amen to that? 
And that, my friends, really is the basis of us being marked by victory. Not only when things start going our way, and I believe that's amazing when you do an everyday relationship with Jesus, things start going your way more. I'm just saying that. It's hard to have the God of this universe walking beside you and that not help you. But victory isn't even about how things play out. Yo, everywhere you turn, you have the love of God in Christ Jesus going, hey, I'm here to help. Amen? And that makes all the difference. That's the reason Paul could say, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble? Nope. Hardship? Nope. Persecution or famine? Nope. Nakedness or nakedness? Nope. Danger or sword? Nothing can separate. Because everywhere you turn, there's the one going, hey, I'm here to help in between you and whatever you face. Come on, smile. That's really good news. So as we wrap up our time, I wanna ask you the couple of questions we ask at the end of every single service. And it's not because we're not creative, it's not because we're like a broken record, it's because we believe that life, lived to the full, is an extension of not only hearing God's word, but doing God's word. So we ask you the question, what is God saying to you? And what are you gonna do about it? How has God cracked open that window on your stinking thinking and how has he challenged you to make these confessions out loud? Seriously, some of you all need to maybe change your screensavers on your phone and put these statements down even throughout the course of this week and every time you look at your phone, which is like 72,000 times a day, you need to see these four statements. Maybe you need to write it on your mirror. Maybe you need to get some lipstick and write it on your mirror. Like if, if, you, if it's not your mirror, ask permission first, but like, what are you gonna do about it? Because I promise you, these truths confessed will make a difference in your days. Can someone say a good amen to that? I really feel compelled in my spirit, just to take a minute right now, there's someone in one of our campuses who over the last 31 minutes has been thinking to themselves, wow, I got a lot of Jesus, like as far as head knowledge, but I don't have him in my heart. You know what, I wanna be marked by victory. But this religion thing has only brought me so far, I need to invite him to be my friend. We want you to know that's all Christianity is. It's not about rules or regulations. It's not about doing things. It's about what he has done to make you victorious, amen? So with every eye closed on every single campus, if that's you right now and you wanna invite Jesus to be your Lord and your Savior, your friend and victory giver, when I count to three, lift your hand where you are. Recognize, religion doesn't give you your victorious life. A relationship with Jesus does. Are you ready? One, two, three. Just lift your hand where you are. I see your hand there. Is there anyone else? I see your hand there as well. Is there anyone else? Hands up here at the 915. Let's just pray this prayer out loud. Come on, let's do it out loud all together. Dear Jesus, I invite you to be my Lord and Savior. Help me by your spirit to live now for your glory. Amen. Can you put your hands together for the people who lifted theirs? So cool. You're gonna have a campus pastor or a leader come out later and talk to you about your next step if you lifted your hand. For the rest of us, who'd be brave enough to say that they got a little bit of stinking thinking in their life? Come on, they got a little bit of negative. Come on, put your hands up high in the sky, let the whole world, okay, you're all. <laughs> See, you're not alone. I'm going to get everyone to stand to their feet. Come on, let's stand to our feet on every single campus. I'm gonna invite our ministry teams to get to the positions. And we're gonna sing a song out loud with our lips. But I'm praying in the name of Jesus that these words are gonna go from lyrics on your lips to become the soundtrack of your lives. That you're going to walk around knowing so deeply because you're children of God, 
He's for you, you're chosen, you're free. His love has got you, amen? So we're gonna worship God together. Dear Jesus, we love you, we trust you. By your spirit, make this our confession and reality, amen. Sunset.